May Blu-rays. So uh, yeah, it's your time to shine, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, May, I think, was a little better month than uh, April. April, the pickings were a little slim. March was really good, and uh, we kind of dipped down in April. But I think it came back with a with a vengeance in May. Uh, really, really good stuff. And so we'll, we'll start out on uh, May 2nd, and we'll just do it chronologically like we normally do. And how about, uh, you know, we can start with one of the uh, lower points of the month, uh, the Hindenburg. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> yeah. Have you tried to watch that recently? No, uh, I tried about ten years ago, maybe fifteen, and it was really, really bad. <laughs> I tried to watch it last year again, you know, for the first time in many years, and uh, boy, what a bore that movie is! It is so boring. Yeah. The- only thing that's good about it is the Albert Whitlock special effects. I mean, there are some spectacular, uh, you know, Albert Whitlock was a major uh, force in, in matte painting, you know. The, yes. uh, what what uh, If you don't know what a matte painting is, it's basically a painting that's, that's uh, incorporated uh, into, you know, live action. Uh, it's the old, old, old way that they do things, you know, with digital now. You know, digital's replaced... Uh, matte paintings in general, I think. But uh, there's some spectacular work from Albert Whitlock, uh, who I should also say, you know, worked with Mel Brooks and, and, uh, and of course, uh, 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 Alfred Hitchcock uh, a lot. And uh, some of that stuff is great, but boy, story-wise and just acting-wise and almost everything else, even though it's directed by a really good director, Robert Wise, it's just not... <laughs> It is dull. You're just waiting for the end. I mean, you're just waiting for the thing to blow up. (laughs) That's basically it. it. Yeah, and they even botched the end of it when the uh, you know it's supposed to be so climactic. You know, the uh, the the recreation of the Hindenburg, you know, crashing, and they keep you know they they build up the suspense and then they just pause the pause the film right in the middle of it crashing over and over again repeatedly. It's a really weird thing how they do that and they just uh and then they cut they use the real footage and then they cut into uh new footage and they just it's it's not well done for the and robert wise of, directed so yeah. yeah the using of the real footage you know is dumb i think yeah really, it is it is really dumb but then again back then maybe they didn't know how to really do it or whether but they should have worked on it more uh, yeah it's it still won a special oscar for its uh for its uh, special effects, uh, so how is the uh, uh, David Shire score? Because <laughs> I always see oh, that that's album. Oh, that's good. That's good. I think that's probably one of the better things about it, actually. Mm. Uh, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Yeah, because he's he's pretty dependable. You know, most of his stuff is is usually. I, I love uh, him. Yeah. Yeah. Me yeah. too. Me too. So yeah, that's that's that, that would be one of the the saving graces of it and uh, it and it, you know it is it's it's well shot but it's just the story's not there like uh, Dean said it's just it lumbers yeah um, it it does it does you know what good. you know what uh you know what David Shire score that I would love to to have but they've never I don't think they've ever isolated it and released it <clears throat> is straight time yeah I love yeah. straight time music yeah I mean, oh yeah. mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's one of his greatest scores, no question that's about great, it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah uh, I found a, I, I found an MP3 of the theme from that on SoundCloud, but that's the closest I've come to finding anything. I haven't I haven't found anything other yeah, than Yeah, and that, it and but. it has it has the uh it has the sound. It it's fr- it is from the opening credits and so it has all the sound effects of the bus and everything else. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> scooped off of the actual the actual print. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, yeah. So anyway, the Hindenburg, and 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 another thing to talk to mention about the Hindenburg, uh, if you think it's long as it is and dull, well, they added ten more minutes to it when it came on network television. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> just just for whatever it's worth, I do remember that specifically. Is there like special it. footage of um, of um, uh, George C. Scott berating Robert Wise? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> or, is, yeah. or is it the ten minutes that he, is it the ten minutes that he cut out of Magnificent Ambersons? That would be cool. <laughs> that would be very, cool. Yeah. very good, very good. Touche. Yeah. So so we'll uh, and how about Space Hunter: Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, uh, yes. which was released yes. in the 3D craze of the early 80s. Uh, Mill Creek has released this one, um, and I don't think it's in 3D. I think it's just in standard 2D, which is kind of crazy, actually, because uh, that's the only selling point for that movie, I think. Yes. Um, I thought the only selling point that he played a, a, an intergalactic garbage man. I thought that was the, that was the selling point of the movie, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, let's, let's, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of these films at this time. There's this, there's Metal Storm. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these. That, yep. you know, it should just be a film festival of shit, um, and they should show all of them. And there, the sad thing is, these films are better than a lot of the movies that we consider A-list movies today. That's I what agree. I find. Real, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, I think you would agree. I think we'd all agree that there's some. There is in these films, these low-budget things that that were all Star Wars knockoffs at the time, um, are so much better than a lot of the stuff that comes out right now. That's his first run. Um, yeah, I, I know I'm, I might be alone in that, but I, I actually do feel that way. I agree. I agree. There's a there's a nauseating nostalgia that creeps through my heart. That it really it really is. I mean, I'm I'm wondering if 30 years from now, if if people that are children now are going to be nostalgic for Transformers, and how bad are movies going to have to be 30 years from now? For them to feel nostalgia for <laughs> yeah, I you know somebody have nostalgia for, for nostalgia for a bowel movement. I mean, you know, I, you know, never mind. Well, yeah, it's yeah. possible, yeah. by it's the, the way. Same difference. It, it's possible that movies will get better, and pe- those people who were raised on garbage w- will go. God, I loved it when movies were more garbagey. <laughs> so maybe that's what's going to happen. Wow, oh, look at I that! Tried. A hopeful note from Dean. That's pretty yeah, cool. no, no, that's right. Right. yeah. Really positive, but, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, lo- I love the t- I love the title. Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. I love yeah. the fact that it was like a. I love the fact that it was a Cinemax staple back in the day. Oh, yeah. uh, and you know, it's. I don't know why it's not in 3D, but when they don't play things in 3D, isn't it all fuzzy? Like any time you see Jaws 3 on TV, it's fuzzy as hell. You know what I'm talking about? Blurry. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I can't explain that. I don't understand why why things look fuzzy on television. Uh, I'd like to know the answer to that, but it's true. It just, yeah, Friday the 13th Part 3 is another one that comes oh, yeah, to yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, during I that time. about that. Parasite. Yeah. Remember that one? Oh, Paras- yeah, Parasite. That's Parasite. Demi Moore's best role. Right. Uh, which is and the, what about which coming, is, oh, coming, coming at you? Yeah. Yeah, well, oh, God, yeah. Say. <laughs> and treasures, tre- treasures of the Four Crowns. They're, uh, they're <laughs> yeah, oh yep. god, oh no. my god! They're... You win, but... Dean. You win. You win. You brought treasure of the Four Crowns. <laughs> yep. And yep. then plus there was all the, you know, this is earlier, but all the sex movies that were in 3D, like the stewardess mm-hmm. and the stewardess. Well, those were so great. I, I, you know, could any of those open this weekend? <laughs> I mean, yeah. no, I'm being very serious. Could anything else have opened? I mean, wasn't there wasn't there like a lost like you know uh, Andy Sedaris movie that could have opened? I mean, seriously, <laughs> there was nothing. There was nothing else that could have opened this weekend. War well, Machine could I mean, have I, been released I, I, I know the actors. I know the actors that were in those old sex movies, and they were open every weekend. So it's not the. <laughs> yeah, not I know. You know. My uncle Leon can attest to that. But I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay, yeah. We get nostalgia for the old, for the 3D of old. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, how about uh, the Naked Cage from 1986? Uh, Screen Factory issued mm. that with uh, Sherry uh, Shatuk and Angel Tompkins. It was the director of Chained Heat, uh, one uh, of those prison flicks. Never saw it actually, but. Uh, I kind of remember when it used to turn up on cable. Speaking of cable, it uh, hang on, Adam. I, th- I yeah, I'm going to rewind to when I first brought you on tonight, and you said that this was a better month than usual. Is is the evidence <laughs> of that coming up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, well, so far, dude, I'm I'm really. I, I, well, are you paid to say that? 
<laughs> no, we're getting to it. I'm trying to get the bad ones out of the way first so we can uh, okay. get to the cream of the crop. <laughs> I, I hope the cream is worth it. I mean, it is, it man. is. We're getting there. Because uh, I was going to mention Seven Days in May from John Frankenheimer. Now, that's a good one. We can all agree on that one, I think. We can that's all agree it's going on right now. Um, <laughs> That's a fantastic yeah. movie. That's one of my yeah. favorites of his his works. Uh, even oh, though yeah. I I don't really like the scenes, <clears throat> they're important to the story. But I don't really like the sort of romantic scenes with uh, Ava Gardner. I find them quite dull. Mm-hmm. But uh, I kind of always found her kind of a dull actress in general. I think she's, <laughs> uh, I think she's be- oh, beautiful God. and everything, but I've never. <laughs> We're gonna have another Joe Crawford thing. People are gonna yeah, write but in. I see. So you're saying that she had nice headlights. That that when you were saying that she had great headlights. That's about it. <laughs> but uh, but otherwise the movie is fantastic. I, I you know it's that it's that great John Frankenheimer sort of photograph black and white photography that's very unique to the to his '60s work. Uh, and a really uh, you know we're. I, I, you know, it, it as the days pass, the story becomes more and more believable. <laughs> you know, yes. if I can say that. Yes. You know what I mean? It, it, yes. it feels more, feels more and more believable. Um, but uh, I do love uh, Frederick March, and it is the president. Uh, and I mean, you know, he gets kind of overshadowed by Kirk Douglas and. Uh, Burton Lancaster. Basically, if you don't know what the movie is about, it's about a, a, a military general uh, staging a coup against an unpopular president, a secret coup. And uh, uh, but it's got a great cast, you know. Who, who is it? Edmund O'Brien? Is it? Uh, is it? Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> Lancaster and Kirk Douglas and Frederick March. And yeah, uh, Edmund O'Brien. Edmund O'Brien. Plays. Martin Balsam. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a really early role for John Houseman, too, who was at that point not an actor. He was mm-hmm. he had never acted before, but uh, uh, he was mostly a producer, most famously for Orson Welles. But uh, Frankenheimer uh, you know, got him to be in the movie for a couple of scenes, and he's got a couple of really great scenes in Yeah, there. also scripted by Rod Serling. So it's worth yeah, mentioning. I mean... It's one of the two, you know, he the two great scripts that he contributed to motion pictures. So I mean, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's uh, Warner Archives issued this, and uh, if you are a fan of the film, uh, it has commentary by Frankenheimer also that was recorded shortly before he passed. So uh, if cool. if you want to know about what he thinks about it and all that, it's you can find out. Uh, another thing will uh, that was released on May second would be the 40th anniversary edition of Saturday Night Fever, which features the director's cut of the film, which um, is not really as big of a difference as I had hoped that it might be. It's only four minutes longer. Uh, the differences are very minor, just you know, kind of extensions of scenes. And, Things of, of that nature, nothing, nothing really earth-shattering. But uh, the good, the good news is that it looks great. Uh, this is probably the best looking. Uh, that it, it's never looked this good on home video that I know. I've owned it several times, uh, and it's really quite spectacular. So if you're looking for a, and if you don't want to see the director's cut, there is an, an option to get the original here as well. You can, you, you know, so it's not like you're oh, being forced good. to watch the director's cut so uh and lots of featurettes and commentary by uh our friend uh john Badham, of course friend of the show and uh so um you know certainly certainly worth worth picking up i would say yeah so that's, um that's a uh, that's definitely one i'm gonna get i think oh yeah it's certainly worth it and it's not really not really very expensive uh it's pretty pretty uh inexpensive or it's certainly worth a Getting a uh, real genius from 1985. It's uh, one of those that there's a fondness for. We we're talking about movies with a fondness. Well, this is one that has its built-in. It might uh, be his best role. Let's not be Val Kilmer, yeah. 
it may be Val Kilmer's best role. I mean, let's not beat around the bush. It's a very funny yeah. movie that really rests on him for the most part. Mm-hmm. I mean, very manic performance. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's very good in it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a great, that's a really, I, I mean, of all the, um, Remember, that's you have the My Science Project, Weird Science, and Real Genius, and I think Real Genius is the one that holds up the best. Um, mm-hmm. It's the smartest one out of all of them, you know. Oh, God, yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, My Science Project is rescued on Dennis, Lor- Dennis Hopper, and, uh, <laughs> and when he's not in the yeah. movie, that movie is a, is a, is a slog. I mean, yeah. But, we, did a, uh, we did a Real Genius um, anniversary show two years ago. <laughs> and that was uh, Martha Coolidge, right? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, so. yeah. Mm-hmm, I believe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That so, was a period uh, of time. I mean, people people talk about a lack of female directors today, and you know, the, there certainly are, and there always have been. But there was a period of time in the '90s when a f- when a few of them were entrusted with some pretty, for the time, b- big studio efforts, um, and Martha Coolidge was was one of those. Yeah, Mark Randa, Haynes, and, Randa Haynes was another one that people don't know about very often. And, and, yeah, what ha- and what happened to all of them? I mean, that's the thing. You know, they, TV. They, they're still around, but you don't see yeah, them uh, they doing Yeah, do they, A lot of them do yeah, TV. Kind of sad. Look, yeah. Yeah, but really good stuff. But uh, yeah, well, how about Brewster's Millions with uh, oh, <laughs> uh, John, oh, man. John Candy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is the worst. You know it's a remake, right? It's a remake of a of an older uh-huh. film. But yeah, uh, uh, that is one of the worst things. I remember rev- having to review that back in college, and it was so depressing because I, and I do believe that that's the movie that that, uh, in some ways, kind of ruined Walter Hill's career as a director. Uh, I mean, it, it it never really felt like he came back after that. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it is so painfully unfunny. And I mean, uh, that's really saying something when you've got both Richard Pryor and John Candy in the same movie. But it just, yeah. it, it just, it's another one of those terrible uh, Richard Pryor vehicles from the '80s that just uh, died. I mean, there were some good ones, you know, like I mm-hmm. like uh, some kind of hero and. Uh, and a few others, but uh, Bustin' Loose, yeah, Bustin' Loose is okay. Oh well, yeah, you know, like as as a dumb, you know, Saturday afternoon movie, right? But uh, but uh, you know, generally they were unwatchable, and then this one is is definitely one of those. Did Walter Hill also do the toy? No, no, that no that's was Richard Donner. I was gonna right. say, yeah, yeah, that's Richard right. Donner, right? That's right. Yeah. But that was yeah, another one that well, was uh, unwatchable. <laughs> well, well, we're we're speaking, all fallible. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I guess. Well, so. Walter Hill's been around uh, on all the uh, a lot of the podcasts promoting his new film, which incidentally also yeah. came out this month, The Assignment with uh, Sigourney Weaver and Michelle Rodriguez, which is getting pretty positive word of mouth. I have not gotten around to looking at it yet, but. Uh, but the, but he's been promoting that. He has some in- interesting things to say about Brewster's Millions, and I think uh, some of the failure of that could probably be attributed to Richard Pryor. I just don't. Yeah, think that's was... the impression I got from the the oh, right. uh, Freddie Snellis podcast yeah. that he really sort of leaned into that theory on um, yeah. Richard Pryor. So um, yeah, I, I mean that's the thing that struck me about Brewster's Millions is how unfunny it was. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing that you're being. You're absolutely right. It's just that's the thing that really gets you. You have those two, and the movies are done. I mean, yeah. and there's no worse feeling than just you know. It's like I can't stand that feeling of like I don't go to comedy shows very often because uh, like live comedy because I hate that feeling of being in a room where someone's trying to be funny and uh, uh, and they're not and just. It doesn't matter if if uh, the audience is laughing. If the audience is laughing, it's almost even worse because you're like, ah, this is so funny. Why are you la- unfunny? Why are you laughing? And then, uh, you know, of course, if nobody's laughing, it's even more uncomfortable. And 
that's the feeling that, that Brewster's Millions gives me is that, <laughs> that sort of, God, get me out of here. It's, yeah, it's um, you know, I I think John Candy was giving it his all from what I get from Walter Hill's take on it. He said John Candy was giving it his all, and he just came in with a, a can-do attitude, but but Richard Pryor just wasn't really feeling it, and uh, I think that the film suffers because of it, but. Uh, but speaking of Walter Hill, we all, I, I did mention the assignment, which is out this month as well. And uh, we're going to get to this later, but I'll go ahead and take care of it now. Shout Factory, uh, on their Shout Selects label, has released Streets of Fire as a two-disc special edition with uh, uh, lots of uh, bonus features. There's a documentary. Uh, there's a, a five vintage featurettes. There's all the music videos. Of uh, the songs from the film, uh, of course, the most notable one is "I Can Dream About You" by Dan Hartman, which became top ten in summer of '84. Uh, and there's a new 2K uh, scan of the inner positive. So if you're a fan of Walter Hill's "Streets of Fire," there you go. Now that one I like. <laughs> that that yeah. one I I enjoy still. I I uh, I like the music. You know that Jim Steinman music that's in it. Like uh, uh, what's a tonight's what it means to be young or something like that is mm-hmm. that what it's mm-hmm. called? Uh, so, yeah. It's, there's a lot of good good music in it. Uh, it's flawed, I know, but uh, you know that cast is pretty good. I mean, I'm not a big Michael Pere fan, but he looks good here, and and of course Diane Lane is uh, is fantastic to look at and. Uh, let's, let's, we got to give it to Diane Lane. We we're talking about her last week with Paris can wait. I mean, to be in the business this long and still be this good. I mean, yes. that that to me is that is right there is um, worth every accolade. To be that good in Streets of Fire and then to be that good in forty, I guess like is it is it like at least third, third well over thirty years later is incredible. I mean, yeah. I, I, my hat is off to her. I mean, and to constantly reinvent herself, too, which she's yeah. had to do. I mean, she's I, pretty fearless I, I about to... that, I think, yeah. you know. And she's somebody that, she's somebody I feel like, uh, feel like, you know, we'll wait wait around for a role, you know. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll not, uh, it doesn't feel like she'll do just anything. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, but I, I like that she, she she was uh, one of the people that you know kind of early on uh, you know dipped her feet into the indie waters with things like uh, uh, a walk uh, a walk to the moon and and things mm-hmm. like that. So, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean she's 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 great. She's one of my first yeah. uh, screen crushes, to tell you the truth. You know, <laughs> uh, ever ever since uh, a little romance, I've been in, in love with Diane Lane. Oh yeah. Um, mm. But, uh, and she looks looks great in Rumblefish that came out last month. I noticed how striking she was in that film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, uh, and and in the Outsiders and and so forth. Mm-hmm. But uh, also, we should mention the cast include the cast of Streets of Fire includes. Uh, uh, let's see, Robert Townsend is in it. Uh, yes. But then we've got uh, uh, Amy Madigan, right? She's fantastic yeah. in it. Uh, yeah. Rick Moranis. And uh, Willem Dafoe is the yeah. is fantastic as the villain. So I mean, it's mm-hmm. it, it's and it's got really really good uh, design to it. It's got a really it does. sort of like a quasi futuristic, quasi nostalgic yeah. kind of design mm-hmm. to it. That's uh, that's that's kind of unusual, and it's 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 got its problems, but I like it. Oh yeah, yeah oh, it's a two, very two original thoughts film. Just occurred to me. Two thoughts just occurred to me. One. <clears throat> because we're talking about Willem Dafoe in a, like a musical, I think he'd be great as the MC in a production of Cabaret. I'd like to see that. That would be good. Uh, that would be kind of <laughs> neat, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And second thing, uh, the only th- the only thing I remember about Streets of Fire because I I don't even know if I've ever seen it, but I did turn it on cable one time and it was on. And there's a conversation between Michael Pere and Diane Lane on a staircase. And so it cuts to her, then it cuts to him, and they go back and forth. Every single time they cut to Michael Pere, his hair is different. And <laughs> I mean, it's uncanny. Out of five separate shots, he has like five different 
hair lengths or <laughs> styles or his hair's on his face and then it's not. And, and uh, that's the only thing that stuck with me about that movie is the bad continuity <laughs> in that scene. <laughs> I remember <laughs> thinking the same thing about the uh, 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 Year of the Dragon. The uh, um, Oh, yeah. Everyone <laughs> did. Mickey Rourke's yeah. hair, I mean, just changes every fucking scene. I mean... Oh, that's it's one of the worst things about the movie. It's just so distracting, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway. But I will say about uh, Streets of Fire is it's wonderfully photographed by Andrew Laszlo, who photographed most of Walter Hill's uh, the the seminal movies in his you know the early part of his career. He's the same guy who photographed Warriors and Southern Comfort and The Driver. So or not The Driver. I don't think he did The Driver. But anyway, he did a lot of those early Walter Hill films. So uh, it's. Do you do Long Riders too? I believe he did. Yes, which yeah. is coming out by the way in August. They're doing a, a reissue on that, but that's coming down the pike. But anyway, it looks like a Walter Hill uh, a, a time for. Um, Reevaluation of Walter Hill because all these Walter Hill titles are coming out. So um, good. he he did some stuff after though, Brewster's Million that's worthwhile. I mean Extreme Prejudice um, to a lesser extent, Red Heat. I mean when we get into the nineties, we get into I mean An- another forty eight hours. <laughs> that that's the problem. Um, we get into another forty eight hours, which is supposed to save everyone's well, you also have career. Wild Bill in 96, I think. That's not a that bad movie. movie. That's, That's a good not, movie. It's yeah. not a bad movie. Um, and then you have the the actual um, the actual version of Yojimbo Red, um, based on uh, the, the Dashiell Hammett story, Red <laughs> Harvest, Last Man Standing, which just doesn't work. Um, right. Some people it. have good things to say about it. Uh, I've, I've, it, it, I've read it's, occasionally. I think Christopher but. Walken... I think Christopher Walken's good in it. He was the villain, right? He played the. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, it's I've not never, a great movie. I've never it's seen not a it, bad so. movie. It's just kind of like, don't mess with the original. Kind of like it works so well in the samurai thing. Um, but I got to give him points for trying, though. I can't fault him for that. I mean, if I was going to say if Walter Walter Hill um, in this century, what do we have? Bullet in the head and um, the assignment. I guess right. Those are. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, you know, uh, you know, there was that terrible sci-fi movie, uh, Supernova. Uh, which oh, he, that he was did, a dud. Yeah, <laughs> which, that's that's a bad which one. Which he put yeah. another name on. You know, he didn't even he didn't always even a sign of greatness. But uh, you know, for me, I guess I guess uh, Wild Bill is the last movie of his that I I really thought was a note. I mean, I do. I you know I have problems with extreme prejudice, really, I, really. I, I but I just do feel like I do feel like Brewster's Millions is the is the demarcation line <laughs> because up until <laughs> that point, with you know with the amazing you know procession of you know the Warriors and Long Riders, Southern mm-hmm. Comfort, Forty Eight Hours, and Streets of Fire. That's an mm-hmm. amazing line of movies. And then you you just feel like Brewster's Million steps in there and ruins the whole party for everybody. So, but uh, you know, that's you know five yeah. good movies is, is not bad. I I yes. do I do have some some love for like things like Johnny Handsome and uh, oh yeah, let's not forget Johnny right. Handsome. That's the that's the one. Yeah, I mean you yeah. can't forget that. Um, yeah, jo- mm-hmm. and, and Trespass wasn't wasn't bad for just sort of trashy. Trashy, you know, waste your time watching. Right. Pacino was doing Johnny Handsome for a long time. He said it was the best part he ever read, but they ultimately gave it to mm-hmm. Mickey Rourke. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I remember Johnny Handsome. He was. I, I had you know film nerds in high school, which there there are a few and far between that truly really knew their stuff, like I did. But I, I I do remember there being some of them that were gung ho on Walter Hill. Walter Walter Hill was the best. Maker of kind of muscular man yeah. movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's what. That's, yeah, that's absolutely what he was. You know, and yeah. and still is to a certain extent. So he is. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, good stuff. Well, well, one that we'll uh, just mention in passing because there's not much to say about it is Virus, starring uh, William Baldwin and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Sutherland from 1999. So <laughs> there's nothing to say about it. Thank you for bringing it <laughs> yeah. up. This, 
your bringing it up is bad enough. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's for anybody who wants to know. There it is. Uh, and moving has, along has, to has fair, has fair game uh, been remastered? Are we going to get the remaster of William Baldwin? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Slipper and Fair Game. <laughs> I, not at this point, but uh, uh, anything's possible. <laughs> anything is possible. Remember Slipper, dude? Oh, uh, that, man. that was going to be Robert movie. Evans' big comeback, if you remember yes. Yes. Sliver. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember working at a movie theater. Uh, I was working at the Plaza Theater while we were playing Sliver. And I remember uh, my main memory of it is, uh, uh, you know, you have to put the letters of, of the, spelling out the title over the theater door, you know, so you let, you, let people know what theater it is. And uh, and I took the S off of sliver and put it at the end and made it livers. <laughs> <laughs> my oh, funniest my funniest story about that was um, there was a Michael Mann's Ali opened, uh-huh. uh, and it was pl- it was playing in the theater right next door to Kate and Leopold that Hugh Jackson oh, Meg no. Ryan movie. And, and so there wasn't enough room for the full title. So if you read it straight across, it said Kate and Allie. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's funny. Wow. <laughs> well, there's a. Uh... So, well, um, moving along to May 9th, uh, so we covered the 5th, and oh, the Naked We're Gun Trilogy. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I was going to say, the Naked Gun Trilogy uh, was issued by Paramount. Those, those have been available separately, but now you can get them together uh, in one package, which is for like 13 bucks, which is worth it, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. It's not bad. So, um, anyway, there's that. And uh, speaking of films that uh, we don't have a lot to say about, here's another one, I'm sure. Psycho, the Gus Van Sant 1998 Psycho remake uh, has been issued by Scream Factory. Um, so Yes, <laughs> better better left than talked I, I, about. <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell you. I have to tell you because I've already, over the years, I've talked a lot about Gus Van Sant Psycho. I do have a lot to say about it, but I won't say it tonight. <laughs> because it's the same stuff I've talked about in years past, but uh, I would buy this uh, if I if it had something new on it that wasn't included in the original DVD release of it. D- does it have anything new other than the stuff that's already been issued? Um, I don't see any uh, extras on it actually. I don't see um, I'm not seeing anything new in, in terms of uh, you know, well, there's not going to be any deleted scenes, I wouldn't think. Uh, if it's a shot, <laughs> shot no. remake. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, if it, if no, it had the a new that. commentary on it, I'd buy it. Uh, but the old version had a um, had you know like a twenty minute making of thing. Um, I think that's all it had. But uh, I, I, I think it was a worthy effort, and I'm glad he did it. I'd like him to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> really? I would. What would you suggest? Yeah, I really do? would. <laughs> uh, no, I'd like to. I'd like to see him remake Psycho again. I, I, oh, I you think it's an oh, interesting. Come on. Ex- <laughs> well, he's even mentioned that. I think it's an oh. interesting experiment to see to see uh, to go back and remake the same movie every twenty years in your career, exactly the same way, and see if it somehow turns out feels differently. And if you could trace that back to how you have changed as an artist I, that was the point of the whole kind of experiment that he did and even Hitchcock remade his own movie uh, of course mm-hmm. Psycho was not Gus Van Sant's movie but, yeah. <laughs> but I always thought it was a uh, worthy I always thought it was a fascinating experiment and I don't think anybody expected it to work I didn't expect it to work but I, I watched it with fascination anyway I think what he should do is do it as a live uh, production on NBC, like they're doing these musicals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. Carrie, oh, Carrie Underwood up. could play Marion Crane. So right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a yeah, great that, idea. That's, that's what they should do. <laughs> uh, actually, I do have a list of the special features, and there are a few. So for whatever it's worth, here they are. New audio commentary with Rob Galuzzo, who is the writer and director of the Psycho Legacy yeah. documentary, and Psycho editor Amy Huddleston. So the editor of the film is, you got, there's a commentary here. 
uh, audio commentary with Gus Van Sant and, and Hayesh and uh, Vince Vaughn. I'm sure that's a carryover. And uh, then there's Psychopath, The Making of Psycho, and then Theatrical Trailers and Still Gallery. So uh, there you go. Okay. In terms of well, extras. Well, I mean, as soon as you said Still Galleries, uh, I was in it. So, you know, I'll be <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Rob, Rob Lewis is a good guy. He's a friend of the show, so I mean that that's you know I, I give I yeah. give the if you're gonna pick it up, pick it up for that because that will be definitely very informative. So yeah, and that's yeah, a great documentary, could, the Psycho so he Legacy. He doesn't like it. I mean, he doesn't like it. So I, I'm I'm wondering what the commentary will be like. I'd love to hear it actually. Yeah, <laughs> to tell I mean, you the truth. <laughs> yeah, that's but I love his documentary, The Psycho Legacy. I thought that was. Uh, really informative. I, I have that, and uh, it's it's. Uh, I'd recommend it for sure. Um, so, Serial Mom, the John Waters film with uh, uh, Kathleen Turner, uh, Ricky Lake, uh, Sam Waterston from 1994. It's, uh, Shout Factory has opted for a special edition on this one as well. And um, I, so I've still never seen it, by the way. Okay, well, I've, it was shot. Um, the, the, there's, it was shot around here. I mean, obviously just Baltimore, but the um, the club scene was shot at Hammerjacks in Baltimore back in the day. Um, I remember a lot of people, a lot of friends were to go be extras. I mean, actually, there are a couple of people I'm really good friends with who you can definitely see in that scene. But that's not. I just went. I remember I was like at a, a friend's art show, and his girlfriend was explaining to me like the symbolism of the movie. I mean, I was just like, Are you really? You really want to have this conversation? It's fucking <laughs> serial mob, all right? I mean, really? You're going to explain the similar? You really think you're being original here? I mean, I, I just see, you know, I was thinking that to the other day because I just like, so how some people are so fucking pretentious. And I was just like, <laughs> really? We need to have this fucking conversation? I just want to go get a beer, baby. I don't want to fucking yeah, yeah, but serial mom. C- serial mom uh, has a Barry Manilow song in the soundtrack. I mean, that's, well, that's a go. winner right there. Daybreak. Has day, yes. Daybreak, yes. Yep. Come on. Officially, uh, Barry Manilow's most irritating song, and that's really saying something. I find that song to be <laughs> absolutely... I'm going straight to hell. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> absolutely I like it. just the most, the most horribly sunny, terrible song ever. But, well, I don't uh, give a shit what I'm any of sorry. you want to say. I'm <laughs> sorry. Can't smile, without, can't smile Without You is infinitely sunnier and you know, put on a, your tongue. That's, hat that's, a, that's a, it's a better tune. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I, it's, I don't know. It's, uh, I, Daybreak is just, uh <laughs> Do not. Do hey, not. Hey, okay. L7 stop, is in the movie. Right I don't now. give a shit. L7 <laughs> is in the movie. What more do you need? Um. All right, can uh, we go, Adam? Move along, please. <laughs> well, no I was, fucking May night. Really, move along. You're just come on, <laughs> come on. Well, You're I was slowing the train down, baby. Come on. <laughs> I was gonna say the among the extras on Serial Mom, there are no uh, Barry Manilow commentaries to be found, <laughs> but but there is a conversation with uh, John Waters, Kathleen Turner, and Mink Stoll. Uh, that's brand new, where they all three sit on a couch and discuss making the film. So that could be fun. Yeah, so, uh, I'd like. I, you know, I still haven't seen that, and I haven't seen this last movie, the Dir- uh, Dirty Shame, I guess. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Pecker is actually I'd, really good. Pecker is yes. actually a really good film. Yeah. Um, By the way, I have. It's I ironic have to me. Seen, it's yeah. ironic to me how Kathleen Turner is looking more and more like Divine every day. <laughs> oh, Ooh, dude, that is just <laughs> oh, harsh, man. That's harsh. <laughs> Yeah, oh, goodness, I'll never goodness, forget goodness. seeing uh, Virgin Suicides, and I was like, "Oh my God, that's what Kathleen Turner looks like now." It's this rough. <laughs> aging, aging is not is is not fun. <laughs> no. Well, speaking of Kathleen Turner, on the same day that Serial Mom was released, we also got another Kathleen Turner film, and I think this is one we can all agree on. It's really one of the great films of the '80s, The Accidental Tourist. Yeah, oh, yeah, good. definitely. Good. Yeah, so that was... Um, what what that was Warner, Ar- Warner Archives? Yes, yes, Warner Archive. Uh, it has all the carryover extras from the uh, 
the the uh, the night uh, the one that was released on DVD uh, with the 30 minutes of extra scenes. Um, and there's an introduction by Lawrence Kasdan in here, scene specific commentaries by Gina Davis and a featurette. And uh, there's uh, a lot of the scenes that were uh, reinstated here, deleted stuff. Uh, this is stuff I think could have easily been incorporated into the film. It's not, you know, it's it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, so we have the definitive edition, director's edition of Heat, which I know, Jamie, you have watched. I, I have my copy. I have not had time to look at it, but maybe you can tell us about uh, your thoughts on it. We we, t- we talked a lot about it the other week. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, true. You did. In, I remember. We delved into Heat. Yeah. I, you know, and the weird yeah. thing is I have not yet watched the movie. Uh, I watched <laughs> all of the extras, like all of the Q&As and stuff I watched. But I, yeah. I haven't returned to the movie yet. But it's just something I watch once a year. I always mm-hmm. do, and it's usually it's usually around the holidays that I watch it. So I, I will be oh, checking I, out the transfer. It is a sweet little holiday movie. True. It was released yeah, December fifteenth. Isn't it, though? I, I, isn't usually, it I usually watch it around that time. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I I love that movie. No question about it. It is great. I can't wait to watch the. Uh, the, the the new uh, the new scan of it I'm sure it looks great but uh, what about uh, Jean Dielman 23 Claude du Commerce 1080 Bruxelles that's the uh, mm-hmm. the the film film from Chantel Ackerman that's uh, three hours and 20 minutes of a woman doing her uh, daily chores it follows her around washing clothes and and uh, <laughs> cooking dinner for her son and things of this nature for for three plus hours. And then it has a gotcha, gotcha ending. Uh, yes, yeah, it's and, something just, to see. Uh, yeah, it's it's good. It's good. It's it's surprisingly surprisingly uh, 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 riveting in a way. So. Yeah, it is, and it uh, it, it does deliver the gut punch uh, if you're willing to stick with it. Uh, you can watch it in increments. Would be my advice, maybe. Um, Criterion issued this one, and it's got lots of. Uh, it's got interestingly enough it has not only an uh interview with Chantal Ackerman the uh, director of the film who committed suicide last year by the way and her mother is also interviewed here in a separate piece huh. so you get <laughs> you don't often get a director's mother interview on a uh as a supplement but you do here so. of course Ackerman's last it's movie now. was a documentary about her mother so that was true you know done yeah. right before now, now this her one, mother it, this one's out. not this one's not based on her mother, is it? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, I'm sure yes. there's. I'm sure. I remember. If, I remember those times when I was turning tricks during the day. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this movie. Uh, this is a great. This is a great criterion this to own, actually, and and this movie is important, even though it's rarely brought up. Uh, uh, partly because the title is so. Effing confusing, but um, yeah, it is. It is on. It is on the the list of the sight and sound greatest movies ever made. I mm-hmm. believe it is represented on there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to. Uh, I had to watch it in small, like I said, increments. But uh, it, it's it's worth the journey if you can, uh, you know, because uh, if you get a little restless, just just stop it and start it again, and you can pick right up. It's easy to, but. Uh, uh, one other one I wanted to mention is a documentary I have not seen, but it looks really great. It's called VHS Massacre: Cult Films and the Decline of Physical Media, and huh. it's getting a lot of positive notices. Uh, Troma put this out, and I, I'm I think it's something we all maybe could could uh, seek out because it sounds like a subject we that's near and dear to our hearts. So, uh, and like I I've said, I've seen word, a couple of good documentaries about the the v, the VHS. Uh, the life of VHS and and lots of uh, and the uh, people who still collect tapes. Uh, I saw mm. one called VHS Massacre. I think is what it's called. That's that's uh, this one. Yeah. Oh, oh, one, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's good. It's good. I mean, I'm I still heard a big. Was. I'm still a big fan of VHS. I was just going through all my VHS tapes the other day and and discovering the titles. You know, I got I purged a, a huge amount of my collection. You know, uh, when I moved into the house I'm in, and 
we just had to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. So everything that's left behind is, you know, extremely rare rare stuff like uh the ballad of Gregorio Cortez and uh, uh Marvin and Tig and Best Boy and things like that, you know, uh just very 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 obscure movies. Uh mm-hmm. wow. but uh but I do love I do love my uh my VHSs still. Yeah. I've still got a few too, I have to admit, but uh, so another Warner Archive release would be The Loved One, Tony Richardson's follow-up to uh, Tom Jones, who's the next film he made uh, two years after that. And what a cast this film has. Uh, and it's a satire of both Hollywood and the funeral business, all in one. And it has uh, Robert Morse, Jonathan Winters, and Jeanette Comer, Dana Andrews, Milton Berle, James Coburn, John Gilgood, Tab Hunter, Margaret Layton Liberace is a funeral director in the film, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Roddy McDowell, Robert Morley, uh, and the 25-year-old Paul Williams, the songwriter, plays a 13-year-old uh, kid in the film. Which is I, I, I didn't realize he was 25 at the time. Yes, he was. Uh, so you know he's got that that you know he's a he's a small guy and he could pull it off. Uh, but, What's the name um, of it? The young one. The young, the loved one, yeah, and it, it is, uh, and Rod Steiger also as Mr. Joy Boy, the uh, the mortician. That's, that's the most amazing part of the whole movie. If you yes, ask me. I agree. It's a great, it's a great movie, but uh, Terry Southern screenplay and yes, uh, yes. But also, I should say, photographed by ha- Has in black and Haskell white Wex- by Haskell Wexler, right? Who also and served pro- as the producer <laughs> of exactly. the movie. I was going <laughs> to say the same thing, which uh, which is uh, you know it's something that I learned about you know only after interviewing uh, Wexler. But uh, boy, what what a crazy movie that is! It, it sure really, is. It is really nuts. The uh, the standout scene in the film for me always has been and will be the uh, when we get to, uh, to catch a glimpse of Mr. Joy Boy, the Rod Steiger character's mother. Yes. This uh, morbid, morbidly obese woman who uh, resides in her bedroom and, and has nothing to look forward to except for her son's uh, meals that he brings to her. And he brings, at one point, he brings her an entire cooked pig uh, with with an apple in its mouth for her to devour. And uh, it's just there. And there's a hysterical scene where she's uh, rummaging in the refrigerator uh, looking for the. Uh, the the uh, full fully cooked. She's looking for a whole turkey that was in the refrigerator, and she flips the refrigerator over on top of herself, and she's screaming for the cranberry sauce. And that's <laughs> you have to you have to see this to believe it. It's, it's true. It's it's, it's something it's to some, see. Yes, it's it's a wonder. Yeah, it's it's one of those. But anyway, I would recommend our uh, uh, fans of of kooky comedies uh, to. Seek it out, for sure. But uh, anyway, so a couple other things that we had. Uh, actually, I think we're finished with that day, uh, May 9th. I think we've uh, so we'll move right along to May 16th and uh, the original Willard from 1971. Now, okay, so sometimes I get confused. They, didn't they release this last month? It feels like they they release these horror movies like every six months. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, um, Willard has never been issued on either. It's only been available on VHS tape, never on Laserdisc, DVD, or Blu-ray until now. You mean when they okay. had the remake, they didn't reissue that on DVD? No, never did. That's, I never find did. that so odd. I mean... I think there was a rights issue. Uh, this was produced by Bean Crosby, if you can imagine that. Uh, but he used to have this production company in the early 70s, late 60s, called BCP Productions, B- Bean Crosby Productions. And uh, his company uh, produced Willard and the sequel, Ben, and also Walking Tall, the one with Joe Don Baker. Uh, so he was kind of, you know, he kind of had his hands in in the, the um, drive-in movie business, I guess you would say. I, I wonder what Martin Sheen thinks of these movies, since his most iconic character is named after the, the Ben and Willard. I mean, <laughs> Captain Ben and Willard is named after, no joke. You know, I'm sure you all know, is named after. Deliberately named because he's a rat. They think. Because he's a rat. Oh True. wow, that's that's, that's nuts. That's good. <laughs> Very good. I never knew that. 
But that's I was uh, stunned when I found that out. Like when they had the podcast mm-hmm. out Redux, and there was all, yeah. these, you know, all these interviews and everything. And yeah, I was just like, wow! I never, I never even mm-hmm. thought to look at it like that. Mm-hmm. But it makes sense. I mean, but yeah. yeah. But I think it was a right and, uh, issue. That... And interestingly, the the original the Marlon Brando's character in Apocalypse, he was originally named of Elvita. So I, I thought that was like take, taking it a bit far. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he might have been eating all the Elvita, but I mean... yeah, yeah, this he's uh... method. So he he did eat all the Velveeta. You're right, Jerry. He's method. Out. <laughs> he's yeah, but this. Uh... But no, this uh, this, this Willard has been uh, it's it's a brand new scan of the film, and um, I, I rewatched it. I'd seen it when I was a kid many times, and I, it holds up fairly well. Um, but unfortunately, the sequel, which I'd never seen, uh, that came out the same day, and it it doesn't hold up very well. Uh, <laughs> it's nah, the it's one with a that beautiful, a, a beautiful Michael Jackson song, though, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, first number one. That was his first number one record, and. Um, this is directed by Phil Carlson, uh, who did Walking Tall and Mitchell and, and, and Phoenix uh, City Story in the 50s and many others. But uh, this was toward the end of his career. And uh, it's interesting because apparently this uh, there's a note at the beginning of the um, – the, before the film uh, – before you – it plays on the uh, – when you're, when you're watching it. It says that uh, they have lost the original negative to this film. So uh, any technical quali- you know, problems that you might have might be because they've. I guess they've had to. I don't know how they scanned it. I really don't. But they can't find the original negative. So I find that odd that a film that's only 40 years old or 40 some years old that the negative is already missing. Um, yeah, that but, is weird. But uh, Bing so Crosby kind of probably a... burned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. 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 Like, yeah, like but just anyway. that roasting on an open fire. <laughs> <laughs> so uh anyway we'll move along to the twilight time releases uh, uh one of which is year of the comet which one of my colleagues refers to it as year of the vomit i've never seen it so i can't uh i can't comment but uh i have not heard good things about this film <laughs> now the comet uh, year of the comet is that that thing with penelope ann miller and that's the one oh P- peter yates and written by william goldman um, this was supposed to have been issued by Twilight Time several months ago, and they were holding it up for a good reason. There is an, a rejected score by John Barry to this film, and uh, Nick Redman and the guys over there at Twilight Time were trying to get the rights secured so that they could put this on as a, a bonus, and they were not able. It was a money thing, of course. The Barry estate wouldn't let go of it, and... Uh, and um, they just no. Oh, I think it was Fox actually that wouldn't let go of it. It wasn't the Barry Estate. It was the 20th Century Fox. Wouldn't they? anyway. It was a money thing. They couldn't afford it, and uh, so they just put it out uh, with the isolated original music track in the trailer. But uh, I've never seen it. But uh, like I said, it's it's um, the word has not been good on it. But it's kind of a, it, it, I've never seen it either. It's like a heist movie or something, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Because I, I keep getting it mixed up with that uh with one of those sci fi movies from the mid eighties. What what was that? <laughs> it it feels like night. it sounds like You think Night, night of, the of the Comet. Comet. Night right, of yeah. the Comet, right. I always get it mixed up with that. So <laughs> it's like uh but uh yeah. Anyway. All right. So um, it's so you know yeah. what? They should they should John Barry is dead. Uh, uh breaking news everyone. Uh and <laughs> It would it would be great to to hear some some new old John Barry work that hasn't right. been publicly Agreed. available. Give Agreed. it to the fan to his legacy. I mean, release it. I mean, come yeah. on, don't be greedy with that shit. I know it's it's real sad because you know Nick worked in the uh, Nick Redman worked over at the. Uh, the, and the, when Fox was issuing a lot of their classic film scores, and he did the uh, Varese Sarabon stuff, so he's. You know he's he's been instrumental in getting a lot of these classic or unreleased soundtracks re- put out there. He's the guy who's done a lot of that, and so he's very, you know, he thinks that stuff's important. And I, I just appreciate them at least trying, even though they couldn't make it happen. So um, 
Anyway, but uh, but another Twilight Time release that is a great film, uh, I think anyway, is Robert Mulligan's final film, The Man in the Moon, with uh, the first appearance of Reese Witherspoon and uh, right, first, uh, right. Sam, Sam Waterston, Tess Harper, and Gail Strickland, Jason London, and I just I rewatch this and it really it really gets to you, I think. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, uh, I just recently did a. Um, a uh, article for Zeke Film about my mm-hmm. tw- twenty of my favorite summer movies. You know, movies that yeah. take place during the summer, mm-hmm. and uh, I w- I included this one as one of them, uh, and was thinking about it. And it's like oh, Robert Mulligan is a really good summertime filmmaker because you think he sure made is. Summer of Forty Two, he made the other, uh, of uh, the other and uh, um, To Kill a Mockingbird. Those are all Ooh, summertime yeah. movies. Uh, That's right. So, but uh, yeah, uh, Man in the Moon is is extremely moving, and uh, it is. you absolutely can see the stardom on Reese Witherspoon mm-hmm. in Reese Witherspoon's performance. I mean, she's she's really magnificent in it, uh, even though it's her basically her first movie, uh, certainly her first big role, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know all those things that we love about you know Reese Witherspoon and things like uh, Election and uh, even you know like Cruel Intentions or whatever. Uh, it, mm-hmm. It's they're all right there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. they're all right there in her performance. But uh, yeah, it's it's a really really sweet movie and sure uh, and very very moving uh, and not. Even even with that, it's not overly sentimental. It, it feel it uh, it feels uh, it feels real. Um, yeah. Uh, but it, it's it's extremely sort of nostalgic. It takes place in the fifties, and uh, it, it's it's really good. You got to watch it if you've never seen it. Yeah, and let's uh, mention that Freddie Francis shot this film the same year, same calendar year that he shot Cape Fear for Scorsese and. Uh, you know, he, those were two great late career uh, efforts on his resume. I think that really both shine in the same calendar year for me, anyway. I, I think mm-hmm. it's good stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, another Twilight to- Time uh, release that we'll uh, mention is Who'll Stop the Rain? Uh, Carl Rice's uh, 1978 yeah. film with Nick Nolte. Yeah, and, one of the best. And, I mean, definitely yeah. Nick Nolte. I think one of Nick Nolte's best roles, and it's just great, uh, based on an awesome book. And this is definitely, it's probably the best film you're going to bring up, I, I, I think, at least. Yeah, the, it's worth getting, uh, I think, if you're a fan of it, because there is uh, the isolated music track, of course, as a bonus. And then you have a uh, a conversation with uh, the editor, John Bloom, about the film. So uh, there's a there's a piece with him. Uh, so you know, if you're a fan, uh, I'd say you know it's one to pick up. By the uh, way, um, the, the, the follow-up that Nick Nolte did with uh, with Carol Rice, um, "Everybody Wins," I also like a lot. Yeah. Nobody talks mm-hmm. about that movie, but that's a uh, really it's, unusual movie. Is that a? Uh, it's like a sports movie, isn't it? No, is no, it? it's that's everybody's no. all American. A- a- Everybody okay, wins is Nick Nolte and Deborah Winger. Uh, yeah. And it's it's an odd one. It's an odd movie. Huh. Didn't, Arthur, didn't Arthur Miller write that? Or yes, yep. yeah. That wow. I, I, that's one that's that's escaped me. I still haven't seen that one. But Who yeah. Stopped the Rain is fantastic. Not only for uh, for uh, for Nick Nolte, but uh, Tuesday Weld is his drug addicted mm-hmm. wife. Uh, yeah. Is fantastic in it. Uh, um, Michael Moriarty as the sort of the the guy who starts all of this trouble in this movie. Yeah, uh, it, it, and it's got two great villains in, uh, or maybe even three. It's uh, is it Anthony Zerbe's in it, and yeah, also yeah, yeah. Uh, this is like one of the great American like post Vietnam novels. Robert Stone's Dog yeah. Soldiers. I mean, this is like really. I mean, you know, we don't. This is a movie that's definitely gotten lost. Um, True, and you know, everyone is. I mean, with the exception of some of the actors and obviously the editor, maybe everyone is dead associated with this movie. But when we talk about great movies um, from this time period, this movie gets lost. And 
it's quintessential on the book. I mean, Robert Stone would go on to write a lot of great novels. I mean, remember, there's also um, WUSA is um, based on his book, Hall of Mirrors. And I, I know there's probably other stuff that they're trying to get made. I mean, he writes, I mean, Robert Stone's, um, I, I want to say, I forget, The Children of the Light is probably one of the best novels ever written about movies. Um, outside of um, Steve Erickson's Zeroville and uh, Walker Piercy's The Movie Goer um, and Gore Vidal's Hollywood. I mean, you know, Robertson is one of these great American novelists that we just don't talk about that much, but this is this movie is just incredible. Um, this is just, this movie has everything going for it. and It really does. You know, it has great and, drama, it has exciting action, it has a terrific, you know, climate, climactic, you know, clash. Uh, yeah, I mean... The, uh, I have to mention the two guys playing, uh, playing the henchmen, uh, yeah. Richard Mazur and uh, the late uh, Ray Sharkey. Uh, yeah. Uh, are, they they are fantastic. I mean, it's really it's really a movie. It's if you're a movie lover, it's really got everything. It's it really is. It's uh, that, and it's my it's my favorite uh, Cretan song. Yeah, <laughs> there's I a mean, lot of Cretan, lots of Cretans in it. Movie that you <laughs> could have a double bill of this and Sorcerer of these great lost movies of the '70s. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could really do that. I mean, you could add some others onto it, too, I'm sure. But those two especially, I mean, these are the movies that, you know, we should be talking about more. I mean, yeah. who will stop the rain? I mean, I'll definitely try to pick this up. I picked up Beats. So I'm sure I'll pick this up on at some point. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of the best. Um, I, I can't recommend it enough. I'm looking at my VHS copy of it right now, released on Key Video. <laughs> there you go, I might, I might have that in the basement somewhere, Dean. Don't laugh. I may have the exact same thing in the basement. Because I never throw anything out. Um, yeah. I told you there was some good stuff in the month of May. Now, see, well, you I just knew had that, to be patient. But my thought started off. With, I mean, you started off like in like just the garbage can. I mean, like the garbage see, dump. I mean. There's an art to this, you know. You you work your way I up from the, from the that. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, another Twilight time uh, is uh, Charles Bronson's The Stone Killer from 1973 with uh, Norman oh. Fell and Martin Baldwin. Wow, wow, <laughs> Norman Fell. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah that's another one. Uh, as is uh, I was th- the I was Roy thinking Wo- about Norman Fell last week. I swear to God. The the name Norman Fell crossed my mind, and I actually said out loud to myself, "Why the fuck am I thinking of Norman Fell?" Uh, it was the <laughs> oddest thing. He's, <laughs> that is weird, uh, but it's uh, uh, it, he he had an unusual career for sure. Uh, he did. I mean, to think that he's in he's in The Graduate. He's in he's in. I think he's in Pork Chop Hill, the uh, uh, right the Korean yeah. War movie, and. Uh, uh, one of his first things, and, uh, he, and Bullet, of course, is in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There is a, you're good, good call there. Good call. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Airport 75, don't forget that. <laughs> oh, yes. How can you? How can you forget the airport movies? I mean, <laughs> very easily. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, he and Jen, uh, he and uh, Jerry Stiller and uh, Conrad Janis are all three friends, and they're sitting together, getting quietly drunk while the plane is going down. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a great group of guys there! <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah I, uh, that always funny. just pleases me every time that turns up, and I see those three guys. I can't help but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, the 1953 3D film Inferno, directed by Roy Ward Baker and starring uh, Robert Ryan and Rhonda Fleming, um, that uh, has been issued also by Twilight Time in 3D. So uh, wow, I've never heard of this one. Yeah, Roy so, Ward Baker. So it, it, he's he's a British director. Did a lot of Hammer movies, right? He did. So. He did. Yeah, this was a 20th Century Fox effort uh, from, like I said, '53 during the 3D craze. And uh, and then the last Twilight Time title of the month was the 1965 uh, Japanese film, which I'm I'm wasn't familiar with this one. Brutal Tales of Chivalry. Actually, that was one mm. that I had escaped me. Uh, so. 
Who that, directed uh, that? Who directed that book, Brutal Tales of Chivalry? That's um, uh, Kikuchi, uh, Shunsuki Kikuchi. I think I, I'm probably mangling okay. that name, right, I'm sure. Right. I think you did uh, pretty yeah, much yeah, turned into Charo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know that's why I asked because I, you know, yeah. never mind. I'm gonna go home now. All right. Yes, as you wrote Ozu's uh, 1959 film Good Morning, uh, the one with the fart oh. jokes. Uh, that one's been <laughs> issued by Criterion. <laughs> <laughs> It's good there to know that Ozu wasn't, wasn't above a good fart joke every once in a it's while. It's true. It's true. <laughs> There's plenty of them in there. So, uh, yeah, that's a Criterion release. Uh, and we'll uh, talk about this one. Um, I'm, this may bring back some nostalgia. I'm not sure. Maybe not. But uh, how about Tough Guys with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas? <laughs> That's a, hey. that's a that's a sad nostalgia. It's, it's sad. a sad nostalgia, sad nostalgia, but I'll take it. I'll take it. I mean, it's still a little bit. It's a little bit above Saturn Three, not by much though. But um, it, yeah. It, you know I'll who? You it. know who was a winner? You know who was a winner from that movie? I'll tell you, the the fabulous Thunderbirds. I Wasn't was gonna say, yeah. Yeah, it, that's yeah, right. Good call, James. Tough Good enough. Good call. Yep. Oh, they did tough enough for it, right? Okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. and this <laughs> was the uh, directed by Jeff Canoe. You know, this was the uh, follow his follow up to Revenge of the Nerds. So uh, he opted to do this instead of Revenge of the Nerds too. So good. It was, I thought, you know, can I be very honest? That's a good. That was a good call on his part. Um, <laughs> yeah. Er, early uh, Dana Carvey role too. That's true. Weird. Yeah, he plays the parole <laughs> officer. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, well, and I think that wraps up uh, May 16th, and we're to the 23rd. We're about to wrap this thing up. A um, couple of things here. Uh, Deep on is a uh, Criterion release. That's a more I recent that, film. From I think that's a good sh- – I was really stunned that, that that's – I don't know why, but that's a good movie and from a good director. And, and it's, I, I saw that a couple of years ago in the theater, and uh, it's such a – it's such a fascinating film. You have these people transplanted from the Sri Lankan Civil War into the French, uh, um, just this drug-ridden neighborhood in France, and outside of, I guess, it, I want to see the Paris suburbs. Um, and it's a fascinating movie um, and beautifully shot. I mean, this guy is just a fantastic director. I think it's by the same guy who did The Prophet and The Beat That Skipped My Heart, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean this is a fascinating movie. I, I can't stress mm-hmm. it enough. I, I guess he did. He did the one Rust and Bone. Was what is the movie he did? Um, yeah, yeah I think one? you're right. Cotillard, Marion yeah. Cotillard, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, with a killer Rust whale movie. Yes, I call but, it the killer uh, whale movie. Yeah. That's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the son of Orca. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I find this is this is a really great choice because this is a little seen film. It's one of these. Film speaking, you know, we have the cons going on today, but the film that wins an award that, you know, finally when it does come out, it comes and goes. And so I think this yeah. is great that Criterion is releasing it. It is, yeah. I'm, I want to catch up with that soon. Um, so the 1982 film High Point, uh, starring Richard Harris, Christopher Plummer, Beverly D'Angelo, uh, and directed by Peter Carter, that's been issued by Code Red. And um, I've remember hearing of that title, but I have to admit I've never seen it. No, me neither. Uh, Game of uh, Death. I, I was going to say Game of Death and uh, Return of the Dragon. Shout Factory's issued both of those Bruce Lee titles. Um, and Universal, I guess, to you know, trying to promote the, uh, the upcoming Mummy film, have released The Mummy, The Complete Legacy Collection, which is uh, the, uh, the original... Uh, mummy uh, films, not wow. the ones with Brendan Fraser. So, uh, <laughs> just By to the be way, clear I, on I that. Gotta announce, I got to announce this because I, I I knew that these were going to be announced today. But real quick, I'll just say this: um, Con Film Festival, their Palm Door uh, went to the Square, which is the, mm-hmm. the Swedish film. It's a, fo- a follow up to uh, Force Majeure, which we loved from a. A couple of years ago, mm-hmm. Ruben um, Sophia Coppola 
became the second woman to ever win for Best Director in Can History for The Begun. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Diane Kruger won the Best Acting honors. I, Joaquin I Phoenix, that... I knew, I, I know, is in the new Lynn Ramsey movie, which stunned yeah. people. Uh, the Lynn Ramsey movie got a really stunning uh, reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm hearing good things about that. Yeah, I mean, let's hope that these all get a wide release here, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I'm mm-hmm. really hoping, I mean, I was really excited that Sofia Coppola won. I know people may be, uh, you know, for, for the people that know that's a remake, but it's a different re- it's a different take on the material, so I hope people will be open-minded about that. Um, yeah. Because i got to be honest with you, the majority of the people who go see this movie in the theater today or go to the movies have no idea it's a remake. So, I mean, I, I hate to bring that up, but, um, you know, so I hope and I well, hope people, I, you know, it just looks fascinating. That's just as well. Yeah, <laughs> no, it looks fascinating, though. I can't <laughs> wait to see it. Um uh, I was just I was disappointed that they show the entire movie in the trailer. Of course, true. you know that. Yeah, that, that well, yeah. Thing. I mean, we know that. That that, that, we, that is one of the worst trailers to watch. I mean, if you have not, oh man, they, they just give away I, every indeed, fucking thing. I was stunned. I was stunned that you would go ahead and show all that. Why would they I do mean, that? Why? Why would you do that? That that is it's it's a crime. Uh, but uh, it, it makes me sick. Anyway, uh, just to go, uh, I wanted to mention that the jury prize went to Loveless, the new movie by, uh, uh, oh, God, I can't say his name, Andre Zavajintsev. I can't say his name. But uh, he's the Russian filmmaker who did Leviathan a couple of years ago, which mm-hmm. was a fantastic, fantastic movie. And... Uh, and best screenplay went to Yorgos Lanthimos for the killing of a sacred deer. Which, yeah, uh, I mean, and also went to Lynn Ramsey for you're never really here. So you were never really yeah. here uh, wins too. But uh, uh, killing of a sacred deer. Actually, got, you know, oh, the, the Lynn the Lynn Ramsey movie is like right at the top of my must sees now. Uh, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, especially yeah. I mean, I adore uh, Kevin. I mean, you talk about Kevin. I did too. Uh, and if this, if this is another great, juicy role for Joaquin Phoenix, which it sounds like it, I mean, he's a, like a hitman who tries to save a child prostitute. I mean, that sounds like something I want to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, interesting. Okay, okay. Adam, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. No, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I just saw that uh, right before I called in. So, uh, yeah, good good stuff. Uh, a 1992 Bill Paxton film called The Vagrant, which uh, has Michael Ironside in it. Uh, ah, I've never, never seen heard this of one. But, uh, <laughs> it's directed by well, it's directed by Chris Wallace, who did the uh, makeup effects for Raiders of the Lost Ark and the uh, the Cronenberg version of The Fly. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's uh, the 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 the, ta- the uh, plot basically is a, you got a young executive played by Bill Paxton who's plotted out every move of his life, and then he uh, has a creepy vagrant living opposite him in his new home, and uh, so it's uh, it looks interesting, but uh, it was it's uh, at this point 25 years Are old, and I don't know if it's because Bill Paxton died that they decided to issue it, but Screen I'm Factory sure has is, put but have, they, have yeah have they issued. Um... Traveler. Uh, oh yeah, I like that movie, <laughs> Traveler. Uh, yeah, That's I have another a, uh, obscure Bill Paxton. Yeah, true. Yeah. So uh, it's a good one. Well, what about uh, yeah, Vision is. Quest? Oh, go ahead. What were you saying? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Let's, go, let's, let's go ahead with Vision Quest. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say Vision Quest. Matthew Modine, Please, uh, Quest. Warner Archive, uh, Linda Fiorentino. Um, Daphne Zuniga, Forrest Whitaker, Ronnie Cox, Harold Becker directed, uh, Madonna <laughs> appears. <laughs> this is another movie I always get mixed up with. You know, uh, is Vision Quest uh, uh, the thing about the bicycle messengers? No, no, no that's, 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 that's a monster. Quicksilver. Quicksilver. Quicksilver, right. Uh, right. Uh, is, <laughs> he's uh, a boxer in this or the wrestler, right? Wrestler. No, he's a wrestler. The wrestler. Yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah. I it has a song uh, with Young Young Blood, which is the hockey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They all got mixed together back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vision Quest is the one with uh, "Crazy for for You," that number one record by yes. Madonna. That's right. where it comes from. Uh, so yeah. 
But, Terrible um, song. That's that's Ma- that's Madonna's Daybreak for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I have I have some fond sentimental memories from when I was a teenager that surround that song. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I can't give an honest I'm, opinion I'm, on I'm, it. I'm sure. You, I'm sure you remember masturbating to that song as a teenager. Is <laughs> yeah, <I get> <laughs> Madonna in this movie? She's in it, right? She is. She's, she's she is, yes, yes. Yeah, right. Okay. That's, yeah. that's got to be yeah. Madonna's most obscure movie. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, so what about the Mighty Ducks and the Mighty Ducks uh, D2 and the Mighty Ducks D3? Well, if you uh, wanted to do the, the three Mighty there? Ducks films. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Next, well, we're okay. We'll come up to uh, this coming Tuesday, the thirtieth, and this will wrap it up. Uh, we have a thirtieth anniversary edition of Pele the Conqueror. That's a very good yeah. movie. Now, yeah, that's, that's excellent. And, and Max von yeah. Sydow won Best Actor at Cannes for that, mm-hmm. I think. So, and got nominated for one of his only two Oscar nominations. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, we have uh, Billy Wilder's One, Two, Three being issued by Kino, which I love that film. Uh, one oh, of James my God. Cagney's. Yeah. <laughs> it is so funny. Someone it just is. gave me the DVD of it. I've never, uh, and I haven't watched it since, uh, I think I saw it in New York back in the 90s on the big screen at, at uh, uh, the Museum of the Moving Image or something. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, it's the first time I'd seen it since then, and man, that movie is was funnier than I even re- I remembered it. Uh, yeah. Arlene Francis is hilarious as his uh, as uh, Cagney's uh, wife, and mm-hmm. uh, Horse Buckholz is oh, yeah. funny in it, and uh, uh, Pamela Tiffin's beautiful as always, and uh, just uh, a, a superb, probably probably Billy Wilder's last really great movie. You know, yeah, uh, and certainly, uh, certainly, it was it was almost Cagney's last movie until he, he. I guess he got he got lured back into movies in the late in the early eighties with uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ragtime, Ragtime and Ragtime, and, yeah, and, and then the uh, and then he did the TV movie called Terrible Joe Moran. That's uh, yep, uh, that was a lead role for him. That was his real, uh, you know, re debut or whatever return. But um, this was this was the last movie he did for about twenty years, uh, and and he's got so much energy in it. It's it's ridiculous. He's got he's got some scenes that I just are just absolutely athletic in their uh, verbal acuity. You know, they're kind of mm-hmm. uh, he's just he's just spouting off stuff, orders left and right, and, and stuff. It's just so. Uh, manic and uh, mm-hmm. it, it, hilarious. A great, great movie. I agree. Yeah, it's one By of the my way, favorites. There's something, yeah. there's something in the archives of Aaron's old show where he actually interviewed Jeff Daniels, um, and Jeff Daniels was actually backstage during the interview because he was doing that uh, that play, God of Carnage, with Gandolfini and Marsha Gay Harden and um, Laura Linney, I think, was in it. The one that mm-hmm. Roman Polanski remade into a movie, um, but oh. uh, so Jeff Daniels interviewed uh, with Aaron, and he talks a lot about working with James Cagney in that interview. Um, because nice. he worked with James Cagney on on Ragtime, or because yeah. they're both in yeah. Ragtime, but uh, they That's don't have any scenes yeah. together. Oh, okay, That's what interesting. Nice. Okay. Very nice. Okay, yeah, that's that's it. that's very cool. Yeah. So uh, Criterion has issued a box set, but Mar- or the, it's coming out Tuesday rather. Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Project Number no. Two, uh, and this basically it's a collection of six films that he feels are important uh, enough to to be released in this box. And there's uh, you know the Philippines, uh, there's a film called Insiang, Thailand, Mysterious Object at Noon. Uh, Brazil, Limit, uh, Turkey, Law of the Border, and Taiwan, uh, Taipei Story. So, uh, you know, if that's being it'll issued. Be, uh, it'll be good to uh, be introduced to some uh, some new masterworks that we haven't. Yeah. We're so not familiar he, he, with. And here's a masterwork you uh, may or may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, Blackenstein. From <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yes. 1973. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have to admit, I want to see it. I, I do want to see it. <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, I've, seen, I've always seen photos of, of Blackenstein, and I'm like, I got to see this movie. Yeah. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's in my cart, the soundtrack. I mean, I'm I'm tempted to buy the soundtrack at least. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's probably pretty good, actually. Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As that are most of those soundtracks. And... Yeah. yeah. Sheba, Sheba yeah. Baby is a great soundtrack I want to get. It's oh, a, yeah. It's so I love Coffee, by the way. Coffee is one of my yeah. favorites. Roy, Roy yeah. Ayers. That's terrific. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Ghost World is being issued by Criterion, uh, which I love. Um, yes. One of, my, one of my favorites. Yeah, me too. Uh, and uh, just a few things left here, and we'll be done. The Sheik and Son of the Sheik, the original uh, Valentino films from uh, the silent era. Mm. Zucchino is issuing those. And uh, the 1979 film Malibu High is being issued by Vinegar Syndrome, starring <laughs> Alex Mann and Katie Johnson. So, uh, <laughs> the great Katie Johnson and Alex Rand. Uh, yes. yes, yes, They yes. contributed so much greatness to. They to sure cinema. did. Yes. <laughs> all of, all of his issuing Shag, the 1988 film with Phoebe Cates. That's and, actually a uh, good movie. It is it's like a film. It's it's like a smarter version of like of where the boys are or something like that. True. Right. True. It, yeah. It, it's it's actually quite sweet. Mm-hmm. It's good. It is. And uh, the 1980 film, uh, The Hearse, starring Joseph Cotton and Trish Van Der Veer. Uh, <laughs> horror film, of course. But, uh, yeah, I, wow. Yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, and there's a uh, collection of the... Um, the Joseph Dutate, Cotton, uh, man. I just have to say this. <laughs> yeah. Joseph, I know. Joseph, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Joseph Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is he is he like on the set of the hearse thinking, I worked with Orson fucking Wells, <laughs> the greatest movie ever made. I was part of the Mercury Theater Company. I've been in the company of Hitchcock. It's like what the hell? I'm in the hearse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, it's true. It's so it's so true. And you know, it's funny. That's a that's a thing that's kind of doesn't exist anymore. Like the the old uh, old guard actors going to do horror movies, you know, forced to do mm-hmm. horror right. movies. That, that doesn't happen anymore. But, uh, Who's but left? It a, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, I I know, but <laughs> it's true. I mean, what are we going to cart out, you know, a 100-year-old Olivia de Havilland to be in something? But, uh, yeah. I mean, the, clo- it's, the closest we can get is like, uh, you know, Lee Majors or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, he would have done those kind of movies in his heyday. So, uh, but uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's just something that, but it's so true about Joseph Cotton. I mean, you know, you think about him being in Soylent Green or uh, uh, what? The, well, of course, you know, Heaven's Gate. Even <laughs> he's, yeah, he's in that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but you got to wonder what they're thinking. Yeah. Isn't he in Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte? Also, I think yes. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. Too. True. Uh, well, the Alfred Hitchcock uh, courtroom film, a courtroom thriller from uh, 1947, The Paradigm Case, with Gregory Peck and uh, Charles Lawton. That's uh, Kino is issuing that one, and um, one of his uh, more boring films, I have to say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not, not a great well, movie. No, it's one of the collaborations he did with David O. Selznick, but it's not particularly one of the uh, one of the better ones. And uh, the Kevin Spacey, uh, Danny DeVito uh, film, Big Kahuna, from 1999. I remember yeah. that. I remember that movie, yeah, with Frank Whaley, right? That's an odd. Yep. That's an odd movie. That's yeah. that's the like one a Hollywood that film? Big... No, that's Swimming with Sharks. But th- this I... one is, uh, it ends, it's like these uh, traveling salesmen, they're at a convention, and it, I think it ends with a long conversation about the existence of God. I think it's like it feels like it's based on some kind of off-Broadway stage play. It is. Uh, I think it is. I mean, actually, that's what the, yeah. Is it? Yeah. I mean, that, but the screenplay definitely plays like that. 
Okay. Yeah. And uh, we'll and we'll finish things uh, off with this one. The it's a collection of those uh, Depate uh, Frizz Freeling cartoons. Uh, Sheriff <laughs> Hoot Hoot Clute, Sheriff Hoot Clute, and the Blue Racer. Those are both uh, being issued by Kino. I think those were part ah, of the. Uh, I don't Pink even Panther. remember those. I remember yeah, they ran. I don't remember the air and the aardvark and all that stuff. Right. I don't don't remember that. It was part of that. It was part of that. Yeah, it was. Uh, Okay. So, uh, yeah, but they're being issued uh, because they've previously done the ant and the aardvark and all those So and the inspector. So I guess they're combing the archives for the rest of them. Pink Panther, too, of course, I guess. Yep, they've done all those. Yep, so there we go. So, you know, some pretty good stuff, I'd say, in the month of May. Yeah, not bad. I'm older than Adam. (laughs) <laughs> I, I really, I, I mean, there are a couple of good ones, but I think you really oversold this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay as long right. as uh, as as long as one, two, three, and Blackenstein are out there. Yeah, I mean, you got that. I mean, what uh, else do right. you need? But I mean, to start off with Space Hunter and then the Hindenburg, the Hindenburg. I mean, oh, God, <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, when you start off, <laughs> you know, when you start, start off with a disaster like, like the Hindenburg, Hindenburg, like a literal disaster. I mean, let's, uh, where do you go from there? 